So, hi. Hello again, Erica. Hi, Tony. Glad to see you too. Okay, so today we are here to talk about the situation when a parent should pass away without a will and there is more than one heir or more than one child. So, let me know your questions on this. Um, on this part, attorney, does the number of children have a limit if, uh, and if this has to be processed? Mm, well, as a practical matter, there's always only a certain number of children, except in very extraordinary circumstances. But I mean, most of the time, there's there are the family if the if the parents were married, and under our law, they're called the legitimate children, and the if they if the children are the only heirs the property will be divided equally among them so how many there are uh, the effect will be it's into that many divisions so if there are three it will be divided into three equal shares if there are four it will be divided into four equal shares uh, this assumes that the other parent is not still living but of course if the other parent is still living the married parent, the widow now, or the widower, would be entitled to a share equal to what one child would inherit. So, if there are three children, the inheritance will be divided into four, because it's three children plus one parent. Okay, wow, so I, I didn't know that. That's very, very clear. And um, I think, uh, attorney, if for example, of course, there are cases wherein there are uh, legitimate children, and then there also there are also illegitimate children. So, how do we handle if that will be the case? Okay, it can become more complicated in that situation if there is a family with. That ch there are children born of the marriage and then there are children who are born not born of the marriage who are also the children of the deceased the person who passed away the basic rule is that they are all entitled to inherit the law provides as the share of the legitimate child a certain portion and then for the illegitimate child the devo the default inheritance is one half that which a uh, legitimate child is entitled to. So you're going to get into fractions. So for example, if there is one child born of the marriage and then there is another child who's not born of the marriage, the, the amount guaranteed to an illegitimate child is one half that which a legitimate child is entitled to. This how much exactly one one child will get depends on the specific situation. Because, for example, in that circle, in that situation, there's also, of course, the the perhaps there's the mother, also the the widowed mother. So she's entitled to an amount equal to her legitimate child, and then the illegitimate child or the child not born of the marriage is equal to an amount that is less which is one half of the the one which the legitimate child is entitled to. So you work out, you'll have to work out the fractions for each specific situation. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that people don't necessarily understand exactly what is part of the estate. What is the scope of the inheritance? So, for example, if there's a house and land that the couple owned, the husband and the wife, and then there is a, the father should pass away. And then the question is, what is the inheritance and how is it going to be divided? The entire house and lot is not owned by the father in, in many circumstances. It's actually one half owned by the mother as her share of the conjugal property. 
So you take that half out in your calculation and only yung kalahate, only the one half is the estate of the father, which is going to be divided among the heirs. So the one half in the situation where there's one child born of the marriage and one widow who survives, the one half that was owned by the father, that is now going to be vi- divided into two. So essentially the legitimate child will get one fourth and then the widow will get three fourths of the entire estate. Oh, I'm sorry. Of the entire property. See how sometimes you can slip up even then. The of the house and lot, the mother will own three fourths and the child will own one fourth. If they're the only heirs. Atri, what if um for example the parent or the parent of the Ill- illegitimate child is also alive? Do, do they have do they have inheritance or they're not included in the equation? No not generally. Uh, the if there is no marriage relationship the parent of the uh, child not born of the marriage is not an heir. Not in, not an intestate heir. That is a situation where there is no last will and testament. So, so no, not, not in that situation. Oh, okay. So, do, do we have to, for example, do we have to find out if there are illegitimate children of uh, the parents or... Um, is, is it our duty or responsibility or if there's none that we know of, then we just proceed with dividing it into the legitimate children? Well, most families will know. Most families will shortly find out uh, after someone mm-hmm. should pass away if, if they don't know. The duty is that the all the heirs should be in unanimous agreement if they choose to divide the property they all have to sign off on a document or they have must authorize someone to sign off on their behalf on how the estate is going to be apportioned following the laws of inheritance so if somebody passes away and there's no will the heirs the children the widow need to sign the extrajudicial settlement. This is the formal document where they apportion the inheritance and they will identify how the different things are going to be allotted, how the shares are going to be apportioned. The extrajudicial settlement can only be done if all the heirs are in agreement, unanimous, unanimous agreement. Now, if they try to exclude somebody by simply not mentioning someone that they know of, that heir can come after and say that the extrajudicial settlement was invalid. And if there were any transfers of titles or any divisions, that can be cancelled on that basis. So they are given time by the law to oppose this and, and and have the transfers of titles revoked and brought back so that they can be divided properly. They can also, of course, go to court and and sue for damages on top of the cancellation. Is there a time limit, attorney, on filing for or filling out an extrajudicial settlement for the children? The, there is no time limit in that you can do it any time after the person passed away. But there are practical reasons why you should do it earlier rather than later. Under our law, there is one year within which you should settle the estate and pay the taxes. After that, the estate tax, the inheritance tax of 6% will be 6% of the entire estate is going to be subject to 
penalties, surcharges, and interest. So this can be, and this will add up year after year. So if you don't do it within the one-year period, you're going to be subject to 25% plus six plus 20%. So so the surcharges and penalties uh, that go up are tacked on year after year. If you don't do that, they will just keep adding up until it becomes a practical problem. Is it even worth it to settle the estate, to do the extrajudicial settlement when when paying the taxes in order to effect the transfer is going to be uh, penalized so much already by having failed to pay the estate taxes within the one-year period. The children must uh, do it like as fast as they can after the passing of the parent. So is is it also the same? What are the, the differences or the similarities of getting an extrajudicial settlement compared to a date of so adjudication? The process is very much the same. The required documents, the required supporting documents are going to be, are practically the same. The only difference is that the the instrument, instead of a deed of sole adjudication, you have the extrajudicial settlement, is that instead of one person signing off on it and saying, this, I hereby come into my inheritance and I, I accept it, the extrajudicial settlement instead has the heirs, multiple heirs, dividing the property among themselves or deciding what to do with the property. So they all have to approve it instead of just one person. Okay, so they have, can they do it like on their own as well? Or it, at this time, do they need a lawyer or do they need to go to PAR to get uh, forms? The extrajudicial settlement itself is a an agreement which is written out between the heirs so they can do it among themselves. Usually, of course, as a legal document, it's helpful to have a lawyer draft it for you and explain how the default shares among the heirs or with different relationships, how they, they should be allotted. The heirs then agree in that document exactly what the division will be, and then they can submit this to the government offices. Ultimately, of course, you need to go to the BIR. You need to pay the taxes. The BIR, before it will accept your extrajudicial settlement, will also ask to see that the requirements, the other requirements for for the properties have been already settled. The real property taxes, the BIR will want to see whether there are other properties which should have been included in the estate. So you need to prove, submit other documents like the certificate of land holdings to show that the entire estate, uh, the all, all the own, uh, own properties have been already addressed in your extrajudicial settlement. So, as to your question, do you need a lawyer? It's not going to court, but since it's a legal document and you should be at least advised of what your rights are, what the rights of the different heirs are, what their obligations are, it's very helpful and usually people need the help. Oh, okay, so um, I think Attorney that's very helpful to hear because um, I've I've heard about some people who are having problems with uh, dividing the parents' properties and they're actually um, having a hard time on how to um, process things and they do sometimes they, they do need the help of a lawyer so this has been very helpful. Do you have any um, specific story that you can share on how like a very interesting situation or a case or filing an extrajudicial settlement? Well, an extrajudicial settlement is... Extrajudicial means out of court. 
So okay. oh, one advantage it has is that you don't need to file a case and go to court for it. It's only possible if you all agree, uh, because the the converse, uh, the, I mean the the opposite of that. If the heirs can't agree, you need to file a case in court for to ask the court to, on how the properties, how the inheritance should be divided. Since the heirs can't agree that this person will get this property, this person's these persons will divide uh, this lot. Well, then they present the situation to the court, and then they can ask the court to give a fair judgment of extrajudicial settlement. One, one interesting about, thing about it is that the estate amnesty, estate tax amnesty, has been renewed by Congress. So the families which waited 10 years, 20 years after somebody passed away and then found that they could no longer settle the property because it's not, it's too daunting a prospect to to try to pay all the penalties, surcharges, interest after 30 years, for, after two generations sometimes, at least now they're able to do it. So what's interesting is is that people have learned that now is the time for them to try and talk among themselves, uh, cousins or siblings the, who discussed a property that had not been, that had been locked away essentially. It's with the family, but they can do nothing with it because, because the title is still in the name of the grandfather or still in the name of the, the father who passed away many years ago. Now they realize that they can sit down and work out how to pay the estate tax, draw up the extrajudicial settlement, agree among themselves that perhaps one sibling or one cousin will will manage it and then the the property can be sold and then divided among them. So all of that now becomes possible. What's interesting about uh, these situations is how spread out the people can be a lot of the time yes. they are they are all over the country many of them may be outside of the country but with some work and coordination they can the necessary people can sign the documents and which can then be passed around among them and then submitted to the government agencies so that the transfers can actually be carried out now so so that's what's interesting is that the SA tax amnesty has been put into effect and then it has been extended. So until 2023, at least people have this chance to to have the settlement accomplished. Wow, that's really great to know. I think I'm going to let my friends know about this and have them um, settle everything that they had to settle. So since uh, this agreement is extrajudicial, and we've talked about um, some of, I mean, an example of computation earlier, is it possible that they also, the heirs also agree um, using a different a different portion, like a different fraction or hatian? You know, when they, if, especially if it's a property, it's not really in uh, in money, or they, they don't want to sell some of the properties of the deceased parent. Will that be okay? It's very common. For example, let's say there are three properties: a residential lot, an agricultural lot, a commercial property. And then there are three heirs who are entitled to inherit in equal shares. But of course, these three properties will not be valued at the same price. Perhaps the residential is more valuable than the agricultural. Perhaps the commercial is more valuable than the others. But the three heirs do not want to be co-owners of all the properties. They don't want to each own one third of the residential lot. All of them will own one third of the commercial, one third of the agricultural. They want to go their separate ways after this. They're, they have their own lives, they have their own priorities. Perhaps one of them wants to run a business, perhaps one of them 
uh, never left the family home and wants to continue living there. So, so despite the three properties being valued differently, they can just simply agree among themselves in the extrajudicial settlement that property A will go to this sibling, property B to that sibling, property C to that sibling. Also, in other situations, perhaps the, some siblings might just choose to waive the inheritance. They decide that uh, perhaps the other siblings need the, the inheritance more. Uh, one sibling has already moved to another country and is not in, does not want to be responsible for for the upkeep or taking care of the family home where where they grew up. Whereas one child will want to continue to raise his or her family there. So they can certainly agree in the extrajudicial settlement that instead of the equal shares or instead of whatever the law provides among them, they want a more practical allotment. That's why it's a settlement. It's an agreement among them. They can decide that instead of what the, what the default uh, shares of inheritance are, we can essentially make a total or a partial waiver on behalf uh, on, on for, of the inheritance. A total or partial waiver of the inheritance is possible in those ways. Um, Attorney, what if, for example, one of the children has also passed? And um, of course, this 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 child also had their own children. So, what they uh, what should be done in in that case? Assuming that the child passed away before the parent whose proper whose estate is being settled, the children, the, so effectively the, the grandchildren. Are, can step into the shoes of their their own parent, and for example, there is a grandparent who passed away, and before that grandparent passed away, his son already passed. That son, before he died, had two children. So those two children will divide among themselves, or at least they're entitled to divide among themselves. The share that was uh, going to go to their father. So they can each get one half of what their parent was going to get from their grandparent. So that's called representation. They will inherit by right of representation. Okay, understood. So really the thing, the thing to be said on is the, the agreement between everyone who's going to be uh, an heir. So. Is that going to be like the biggest challenge? Is that is that normally easy to do, or in your in your experience? This very much goes into family dynamics. Uh, I mean, of course, there are logistical challenges. Perhaps if somebody lives in another country, you need to find out. You need to figure out how to do the logistics of getting him to sign the notarized document. That's fine, but it's not insurmountable. The biggest challenge is if there is discord in the family or if they cannot come to an agreement on how to divide. If in principle they cannot agree, they cannot all sit down and, and agree that this is how we divide the property, extrajudicial settlement simply will not be possible. So. The addressing the logistics, getting the documents, and all of those other things, uh, those are not as big obstacles as the fact that there's no agreement that can be made in the first place. But if the family is in agreement, magagawa na paraan yan. They can you can figure out how everybody can sign, how the documents can be notarized, how the missing documents can be found or reissued those things are worth doing as long as the the basic agreement in principle can be reached but if if there's no agreement to be made you simply cannot avail of this and either the property gets locked away or you go to court or as often happens it gets left for the next generation again to figure out uh, when when the 
people who don't agree are no longer there to 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 stop what might be a settlement. Oh, so so the process is going to be uh, similar to when you're a sole heir. Like you have to determine. Is it correct, uh, attorney? You have to determine all the properties that that are subjected I know, to be divided, and then you have to come to an agreement before uh, as to what will happen to those properties and also the, uh, our money or other other assets of the deceased parents. Is that correct, attorney? Well. Yes, if you're going to settle an estate, you do need to know what the scope of the estate is. You need to identify what is included in this, uh, in these properties. So, what did the deceased actually leave behind? What was actually owned by him? You need to go investigate that. You need to show documentary proof of that. You need to get the titles. You need to get the updated tax payments on the properties. You need to get certificates that these really are all he owned. And then knowing that you are now in a position to discuss among your relatives what is to be done. So you can now discuss how exactly are you going to divide all of this. So after gathering all the documents that are needed, and for example, we already have uh, the deed of uh, extrajudicial settlement. Uh, what what should be done next by, by for example, the person who is in charge or managing this uh, situation? So, assuming that the supporting documents have already been obtained, titles, mm-hmm. the, the current um, tax payments, everything has been updated or retrieved, the extrajudicial settlement itself should be finalized. Everybody should sign off on it or at least authorize somebody else to sign sign it on their behalf. You should sign it. And then this can now be transmitted to the, submitted to the BIR. The BIR will check that everything is in order and then it will compute how much the taxes, what the, what the amount of taxes is due on the estate of the deceased and then it will uh, require proof that these taxes are now paid. You pay by depositing at the authorized bank and you show proof of the the payment, you show this to the BIR and when the BIR sees that its it's, uh, assessed tax has been paid, it will issue a certificate authorizing registration for the properties the car or the electronic car which after you get this from the BIR you can now bring it to the register of deeds where the properties are located and you show them the extrajudicial settlement along with the supporting documents and the BIR e-car and the register of deeds will accept these and now transfer the properties from the name of the deceased to the people named in the extrajudicial settlement to to who are supposed to come into its ownership now. So if, for example, the agreement says that the residential property goes to child A, commercial property goes to child B, agricultural to child C, then that will, how, that will be how the Register of Deeds will will retitle the properties now. Attorney, can you expound on the e-car? Because this is the first time I've ever heard of it. It's a certificate. Uh, before 2014, it was uh, drawn up by the BIR, it still is, but now it's issued electronically. It's now an e-car, Electronic Certificate Authorizing Registration. It is a certificate from the BIR that the transfer taxes and the taxes due on the property have been paid and 
this is the proof that the register of deeds will require to before it will before it will transfer the property in accordance with an extrajudicial settlement so it's exactly what it says it's a certificate from the BIR authorizing registration authorized so the register of deeds who is supposed to register the property will ask for it and once they receive it they will accept it and along with the other documents use that as a basis to actually transfer title to the property because uh, ownership in the Philippines is proven through title you you may titulo ba yan they will not allow a transfer of the title yung titulo unless meron kang e car Will, should they have their own e-car or is it going to be like one document um, saying everything for all the heirs? Uh, the certificate authorizing registration will be will identify the, the properties which are <laughs> being being which are authorized to be transferred now. So it's it's a matter of identifying itong which is the which actual uh, property is authorized to be registered. Okay, okay. understand. Yes. So after after bringing the e card to the registry of deeds, they will um, give authorization or the title transfer of titles. Is that right? Is it the registry of deeds? Who give the new titles to the heirs? Is that correct? Yes. So the old title in the name of the father, for example, will be cancelled. The old owner's copy of the title will be likewise is cancelled, and then the Register of Deeds will issue a new owner's copy and a new title for its records, s- naming the new registered owner. Oh, I see. Okay. So after that, um, the, the, oh, the new owner will now be responsible for the tax of that property. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, so I think um, after after getting all the the, the managing and the transfer, the, is it correct that the heir can now use it to however they want? Well, the owner, the heir is now fully the owner of the property, the <laughs> registered owner. So the heir can decide what to do with it as as a full owner now subject to subject to the validity of course of the extrajudicial settlement now if later on uh, an unnamed or uninformed heir should find out that he was not uh, given notice and was not able to participate in the, <laughs> with the property he can come and oppose oppose all of this uh, should come in within a couple of years so that there will Otherwise, uh, he might be barred from from complaining with respect to the registered title. But in other respects, the the new owner really is an owner with all the rights that a company being an owner you can do what you wish. That that's exactly the point of settling the estate, so that it's no longer uh, up in the air uh, what the rights are. But it's actually it becomes very clear. So if he wants, he can go on sell, go and sell the property. If a buyer is looking now for proof that the seller has the right to sell it, it's very clear that if the title is in is registered in his name, he, he has uh, full rights of ownership and is able to sell it. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Atrini. I think that's all for my questions um, for this topic. I really learned a lot. And the process is very uh, easy to follow, and you know, you just have to get the. I, I think I just have to get if 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 I were in that case, I 
just have to get everyone to agree. That's what I really learned today. Well, it's easy in principle, but yes. uh, I, of course, in in practice, there it's often the case that some of the documents are hard to find. Perhaps yeah. the person who passed away did not organize them, or perhaps it's found that documents are missing. His copy of the title is missing. It needs to be. You need to ask for a reissuance of the old owner's copy. Or other supporting documents are no longer available or no long, can no longer be found, and the logistics of getting everybody to agree is yeah. well. Assuming everybody agrees, the it can still be challenging because, of course, you you need to get them off the sign. If somebody's in New York, somebody's in California, somebody's in Batangas. So it still takes considerable work and investigation. Just checking that everything is you know is there takes effort. If you find out that not all the documents are there, you need to go get them, and then you can work out how all the heirs can can now sign the agreement that that is drawn up. So the agreement, of course, needs to express their 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 wishes, and their uh, and it needs to be clear exactly who gets what. So. I try to be clear about the general steps, but in the details uh, become very important for each specific situation. I think it's it's been very helpful. I know that it's going to be a very tedious process, but at least for people like me who have totally no idea on what to do, this has been very helpful and it has really shed a light on how to process these things because sometimes it's really daunting. We, we've the people who are dealing with this case uh, have just had a parent who has passed, and then they still have to process these things, and they're given probably a time limit for at some sort. And some other documents are really hard to get, so it it might be daunting for some. But I I think this is, has been a very helpful discussion. And how to manage this situation. So thank you so much, Attorney, for uh, explaining uh, on how to do this and uh, on how to do it step by step. Thank you also for for your questions. Uh, I will mention that it used to be that the period was even six months instead of one year. So I'm glad that law was changed exactly because of what you said that people are dealing with a recent bereavement and giving them further time. And also the estate tax amnesty, giving them further time to to settle all of these obligations and at least be able to unlock the properties, is uh, is very good at this, at this time. So thank you again, Eric. Thank you so much, Attorney. So I'll see you in the next part of our video. I'll see you. Thank you.